Thank you all so much for registering for interactive lecturing techniques. I uh, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I googled uh, lecture memes. Uh, there were quite a few interesting ones, but you got to give it to Homer Simpson. You may do the dough, dough like Homer as well. So, um, you know, when you are like any questions in class, Anyone get any of these <laughs> questions up? Yeah, and you're a part of the stuff where you said about all this. Uh, I, so today, maybe. I have a student today that yeah. I, said, I said, all right, is everybody ready to, to discuss this? And I had one student who actually said no. Appreciate the honesty. Okay, so uh, goals for today, uh, this is actually, there's a lot to interactive lecturing as I have researched and looked into this. Uh, obviously in about, you know, 45 minutes, we can't get through everything. So we're gonna hit some highlights, uh, but also work, uh, kind of collaborate together and think through some of these strategies. So our goal is, is to identify the characteristics of interactive lectures, contrast transmission, lectures and interactive lectures, look at suggestions for combining engaging presentations and active learning strategies, and explore some of these interactive lecture strategies. So I actually used Elizabeth Barclay's book to gain some uh, insight into interactive lecture. She's who was our guest speaker back in May for student engagement, and she has also written this book on interactive lecturing techniques, which we do have a copy in the CTL which is available for faculty to check out if you would like. Um, and her uh, little definition of interactive lecturing is you have an engaging presentation times active learning methods to equal interactive lecturing. So you kind of have a math problem. I don't have any math professors in here today. It's like the only time you'll see me do math. <laughs> um, now, engaging presentation, when you hear that, what are some things that you think about with engaging presentation? Because this could be up to interpretation. I think where the lecturer is excited, where you can feel the enthusiasm that they have, um, something that helps a lot. Yeah, that passion that you bring forth when you're sharing, absolutely. It tends to hold your attention better, right? So you can track with the information. Yeah, absolutely. Hold it. Uh, do you know anyone who may think that they are really engaging with their lectures and presentation that maybe not so much? Um, yeah, they went to lunch instead of coming here. Right, exactly. <laughs> I know. Like, I'm, I'm preaching to the, to the choir today, you know. All right. I'm not so, going to say anything about Mark Black. Right. Because <laughs> this is being recorded and we'll be on the CCL uh, YouTube. I'm George Goldman. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about active learning methods uh, when it comes to interactive lecture. Now, there has been a lot of debate around lecture versus completely active learning. Um, and that's where I think the interactive lecturing is a nice combination of both of those things because there are some professors who are like all about the lecture and that's all they're going to do. They've been, they have their notes, you know, handwritten from several years ago and they're not going to change anything. Then you have some who are like, I'm anti-lecture, we're going to do complete active learning um, where students are completely engaged. And the big thing about active learning is that activity does not mean that students are actually learning what you're doing. So it's the goal that you to that. And then we have that with that combination of interactive lecturing. Any comments about this before we move on? Okay, so I thank you, uh, Barkley. I copied this, uh, just took it, but I've given her credit for it. Was looking at the contrast between transmission lecturing, where they're the traditional lecture model that we're used to, versus interactive lecturing. And I want to give you a second just to go through and read the differences between when you look at the focus, the format, the supports, the climate, and the communication. just 
going through and glancing through those, what are some differences that stick out to you? Under the focus, that cognitive focus, where it's an interactive, it's cognitive, and interpersonal. Why does that stick out to you, Emily? I mean, I think that just kind of reaches more of a student. I mean, you're looking at right? So I think you're tending to the needs of all your students, not just the communication, where the traditional lecture, the instructor is doing all the communicating, and all the noise. But with uh, interactive lecturing, because you have opportunities to have that two-way communication, kind of like what I'm hoping this is going to be today. I think the biggest strength of the lecture is the concern to get the material out. Yes. You can cover a lot of things. And uh, I've actually occasionally had students ask me to lecture more. Yes. Because they feel like we're not covering enough. And yeah. I didn't pay all this money to hear so and so talk. I want to hear you talk. Yes. So, and there is a lot of value in being able to cover all the things yes. uh, that you need to cover. And sometimes students expect that. They, yes. That, they say, that's what I paid for. Mm -hmm. so, or so, you have accreditation that you have to cover. Yes. Yeah. So that that's always that, you know, when there's the argument of, traditional lecture only versus active learning. You know, that comes into, it. this was just um, something that was sent, it was from Inside Higher Ed, September 9th, 2019, about a study that shows how, and I'll share this with you all, how smooth talking professors can lull students into thinking they've learned more than they have. <laughs> um, and it talks about uh, a study where uh, they had, um, a professor in one class used active learning strategies with like interactive lecturing. The other class was traditional lecture. And what was really interesting, uh, some of those, and those are some of the concerns. Compared with students in traditional lecture, students in active classes perceive that they learned less when in reality they learned more. Students also rated the quality of instruction in passive lectures more highly and expressed a preference to have all of their physics classes taught this way despite their lower test scores. No surprise, probably, from a lot of you all, uh, where students a lot of times expect to come in and just give it to me and let me passively sit here. Um, and then it says, uh, our brains are good at making distinctions between authentic learning environments and artificial learning environments. And of course, the one who was all about the lecture said students need to know content in order to engage in higher order thinking, which is why I think the interactive lecturing is to be able to get those. But here's what the students said. They found the active classrooms disjointed and lacking in flow, and they cited frequent interruptions. Now, we're gonna come and talk about structure in just a minute with interactive lecturing. Uh, thoughts on some of that? I sometimes get frustrated in that sense. Other students might get frustrated because you've got your talkers in the room. Yes. And they may or may not have good comments to share. And so sometimes it's a challenge to draw out the best yes. interactive comment and not to so Yeah. Which is why sometimes it's dangerous to just openly ask a question in class. You know, and and that's where the structure that we're going to get to kind of comes in of how you structure the kind of discussion. I have a student right now who's very willing to ask questions. Her questions are very rarely on point. So you yes. find yourself in a time redirect. And then you've got several students who are really intelligent and can answer and share a lot, but they are afraid to because they don't want to be seen as that guy or that girl. Right. So, so there's that. There's that. Psychological dynamics going on in our classes on 70 days. That's a big group. Very few people, first of all, want to even speak in that larger setting. Mm -hmm. And then those who do, you've got this population. Yeah, and you know, I don't have all the answers to this. Um, I, you know, 
No, I don't think anyone has. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, and you know, this is where I think sharing with like with each other, you know, what works or what hasn't worked and brainstorming together. And also one thing I love about our CPL sessions is bringing in of multiple you know, viewpoints from different fields. So it's not just one field. So that's why I value your input. Now, the end of this article stated that um, something that really helped for those, like the next time they did this study, with those who are using the active learning strategies, like with instructor, the instructor gave a 20 minute talk on active learning and its effectiveness at the very front end of the course. So by sharing and kind of putting a why we're doing this, that really the next time that they did the study, the, the results were a little different from the first time. You know, once again, I, those who know me know I talk about relevancy and purpose and sharing that with the students. So this is why we're doing this. Um, and sometimes I do things and it completely flops. I'm like, okay, what can I learn from that going in till next time? All right. Other things, here are learner stances. So the students are learners when it comes to transmission versus interactive lecturing. Take a moment and look at, and those four categories of repairing, attending, using, and assessing. some things that stick out to you. <coughs> Cramming. I will say I think this is a uh, rose-colored view of what students are going to do. Right. Have interactive <laughs> technique. Or some of them yes. use interactive techniques for 20-something years. Yes. They guarantee you students still study what they have to. Yep. They don't automatically just shift and become the ideal version of what we want a student right. to be. Yes. But is that there's some material that just you just got to transmit? Yes. You, know, you can't reflect on um, you know, conjugating verbs. <coughs> got to learn. Right. Yes. As a former middle school English teacher, absolutely. <laughs> Like the grammar we were doing in you know, sixth grade was the same grammar you were doing in second grade. You know? Yeah. So definitely. I think you have to really sell them on your value. Mm -hmm. I always yeah. think that's my job is to not just this is why we're doing this, but just how it's going to bless your teacher. Yeah. You really got to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. I always think that's my biggest job is to sell them on the value. Yeah, some of the things I read talked about like making sure that you are making those connections, like, you know, make it to that the, the assessments that you're providing, but also real life connections along with future connections as well. So making sure that you're incorporating all of those. And Betsy. In high school, uh, one of the teachers had a sign on the wall that said knowledge is a prerequisite to pre flight. Mm -hmm. And it was my choir teacher of all teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I have never forgotten that. And that it, it, you can get that into mm -hmm. them, that you're yeah. going to be able to go something like that. Mm -hmm. All right. They also shared there are different ways, obviously, and thinking about our class, how many of you teach 50 minute classes? Okay, 75 minute classes. Okay, hour and to so two hour what? Four hours. Four hours. Four hours. Eight hours. You know, so we have a huge gamut. And so there's not a, this is the one right way to do it. There are different ways and different formats to kind of choose your structure for selecting how you would include this. Um, it looks different depending on the time that you have and also thinking through that overall, what are your outcomes or your goals? Thinking about like pharmacy accreditation, uh, we have uh, education, they have accreditation and they they cover uh, in business. There are certain accreditations that you need. So making sure that you are so thinking through the different types of structures as you are planning, um, you know, and breaking it down. You know, it's kind of looking overall what's your big picture, but then how do we break it down to day by day? 
um, and that's going to vary. Um, and I think that's where that the student uh, sometimes it seemed disjointed. Sometimes there were lots. It seemed like there were a lot of interruptions because are you like okay we did this okay now with interaction with I got to do this you know and it's not really you're not really you're you're once again just because you plan an activity doesn't mean that students are actively learning and so making sure that you are yeah you know including and these are just some of the, the different select instructions that you put in. so some suggestions from Elizabeth Barkley in her book were to maybe have some opening bookends so that's where the students have you know something to do to kind of recall some learning like right when you come in. So this is like that starter, bell ringer, something that you do at the very beginning to kind of recall, look back on your prior learning. Uh, because there's also a lot of study around retrieval practice and what that looks like when it comes to application. Overlays, different types of inter, uh, active learning strategies where it's used to kind of focus the student's attention. So these are some things that you need to focus on. Um, interleaves, those are things that are occurring between the time you lecture and the time they come back. And then those closing bookends where kind of that exit ticket application where you can ask the students, what are their major takeaways? What questions do you still have? Um, and so these are just some of the overall suggestions, which um, some of the resources I've shared with you guys today um, includes those particular categories. Now, there are quite a few resources available. Now, we have several, I'm going to start at the bottom, books that we have purchased. I have the interactive lecture painting, and seriously, it's like top full. The first part is on improving your presentations and engaging presentations. So it talks about even like slide design, things like that. The, the last part talks about active learning strategies. So it's looking at the purpose and different strategies that you can that. I also have, have her book on student engagement techniques um, that she shared with us back in May and different strategies that she has included. Uh, this was our book study last year, Dynamic Lecturing, and looking at taking lecturing and different things that you can do with lecturing. And then uh, this is a new book that I just got called Hitting Pause, and it's 65 lecture breaks to refresh and reinforce learning. So kind of those uh, retrieval practice and once again it has very simple they're looking at like time and content so forth so there are some resources available for you <laughs> interactive techniques handout so I've given you all a packet um, thank you to our other CTL friends from Vanderbilt and other uh, CTLs that the that you picked up when you walked in uh, that talks about some different active learning strategies and then uh, I have a really large packet on interactive techniques that um, includes, it's broken down into like looking at lecture, if you have like small class size, individual, working with individual pairs, uh, groups, um, because there are certain things and a lot of the thoughts run in draft lecture, what if you have large class sizes? Um, you know, how can you actively get students engaged um, if you have limited capacity with space and the way that the classroom is set up as well. So there are those things. And then another tool that Barkley actually shared with us back in May is the K Patricia Cross Academy. And this I love this resource and it's free. There is a video library where there are different techniques and you look at the activity types so active and engaged learning and it will sort out different types of strategies, techniques to use like Jigsaw here. And it has a video overview about the technique and then it also has a PDF of materials that you can download for utilizing the technique as well. Um, that kind of walks you through if you've never used, like Jigsaw is one of my favorite things to do um, because you get to 
have students learn and then they have to teach <coughs> other students um, the, the way the, the technique. Anybody else use jigsaw before? Yeah. And, and jigsaw, and it's on the one from Vanderbilt, there's like a little breakdown of how it works. That's something that I also use when I teach online classes. You know, I haven't even talked about online. When I do a synchronous Zoom meeting, like they all have an article that they have read, and then I break them into groups. So let's say there are four groups, there are four, and I divide the article into four sections. All the ones get together into one breakout room on Zoom and talk about their, their section, all the twos, all the threes, and all the fours. So they're in their individual breakout rooms talking about their individual sections. Then I have them all come back together and I reassign them into groups of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and do another set of breakouts where now they're in charge of teaching after they have they read it on their own. They all got together with their group to hear the perspectives from other people. And I go in and out of all the class the little breakout rooms to listen to them. And then we come back together. So same thing in the classroom. So you know I assign something for them to read and I break them into groups to focus on a certain thing. They share their ideas on that thing or that particular section, and then I reassign them into new groups where then they are then teaching and sharing what all of their perspectives are brought out. So, um, but these are just some ideas. So what I would like for us to do, there, there are some resources available, um, and I will send you, I didn't want to print out like 40 and then I wasn't sure how many people would actually show up today. So I have an electronic copy of this that I will send to you all along with the other resources and that article from the higher ed. Um, just thinking about your own classrooms, uh, what has worked for you or maybe not worked for you and let's brainstorm and talk about some of these and learn from each other as well. So that's kind of how I want this to do the last part. George. <clears throat> something that I think works. Okay. So, but it's the think fair share, and it's class of 63 people. We're in 2108. It's a big auditorium. They all sit in the middle, but all spread out. Uh, I mean, clubs. But um, so as the semester is going on, how many weeks are we in now? Four or something? A fifth week. Fifth week. Mm -hmm. So we're they're used to what I'm doing, which is I'll. We'll talk, and this is the story of Jesus. So there's things they can talk about. It's just their opinion. I'm not asking them for knowledge. I'm asking them just their opinion about how this applies or whatever. And uh, the gap between my asking the question, letting them think about it, and then talk with each other, and then I'll say, okay, let's bring together some ideas. When I say let's bring together some ideas, so they are waiting longer and longer to say anything. It's like staring at a competition. It's like, is he really gonna? He'll probably just go on if we don't say anything. Yeah. But I thought it would become more fun mm -hmm. and it's become more like a, a competition or like who's gonna break first. Yeah. And it's the same people who end up breaking the tension. So anyway, that's, I'm disappointed that it's not yeah. working. So, so thinking about that, suggestions, <coughs> By name just feels rude to me. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm the same thing. I like the other <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've gotten it on um, even evaluations that I can't believe it makes people answer, but then if, after sticking thought, I saw how it adds to the conversation. There's ways. Because they're, you know, they're comparing that to the class that right. where you got those three kids. Yes. And again, there's several ways you can handle that, George. <laughs> Randomize, you pull names out of a hat, you can go to people before class to warn you. Yeah. If someone speaks, I'm going to call on you. That's good. You can uh, just go straight down the row. Everybody in the row speaks one after the other. That way they know it's coming. And, I don't know if your groups are, like if your groups are numbered or something, you could say someone from group three tell me yeah. what you all thought and then they can, you know, pick their prey that way. And so it's that might be another way to start isolating who's willing to speak up at the other groups as well. I think it's 
too, about being more organized about our groups because right mm -hmm. now it's just wherever they sit, they yeah. talk about where they're close to. Right. And that's just becoming probably more of their friends and they right. I don't even know if they're talking about it. It's too big of a space. Like, well, I walk around, but who knows? That, that's one thing I was going to suggest is if you had like organized groups, then within that group, everyone has an assigned number. And then you just have a conversation. They have a conversation in their group, and then you say, okay, ones you're going to share out today, threes you're going to share out tomorrow. You guys remember it. Yeah. And then yeah. that way, you're res the whole group's responsible for talking. And I don't necessarily have to share what I thought. I might share, you know, what Marcia thought. Right. What Marcia said. I would just want to call on that. Yeah, you get to, our, in our program, you get to know students as a cohort. So sometimes we have that level of comfort familiarity where it's like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and call on our first Yeah, it may make them uncomfortable, but it's also good for them. We think it's way, way tougher with freshmen. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I would say if you're dealing with something that is not opinion, we are dealing in facts. You need to have a gracious way when a student answers incorrectly, because they're going to feel that. Yeah. You need to have a gracious way to take that and explain where we need to go from there, because that's a lot of in science class, in science and math, they know there's an answer. If they don't know what it is, and you smack them, and embarrass them, then you kill the whole class. You have to be thinking, even if it's plain as a you, what is a gracious way to take this answer and then go back into the story of this is how we problem solve this. George, I'm teaching a class of 56, I think, for a leadership communication class with Donna Brown, and we have had the best interaction discussion that, we, that I've ever had in that space. That space. We had them make tent cards to the back of the little thing, and they can hang off like a little chair in front of them. And that helps us know who to get right. the yeah. names and who to call. There are 10 teams, but there are five or six on each team. And they've started sitting in their teams in clusters. And um, they are making 30 minute presentations, which we can just hear them <coughs> uh, one another on that. And it just seems to have opened things up. I don't know if those are just what I feel is my own comfort level of making people sit. I, but I have to take control of the space. I can't right. just, but I'm a lot more passive, so I tend to be like, I'll just sit wherever you want and I'll make do, you know. But the making do is not working. <laughs> yeah. I have to start. And then it's hard to change in the middle of, you know, this far in, I'm going to have to go. It's going to be awkward for a while. Yeah. <laughs> one of my Russian. classes, they're in teams too. And, um, they sit together all the time, and it really serves them because of the friendships that they make by the end of the semester. The whole you know, bonus that they can for a much more That's what I was going to say in your classes. What's, what we've been doing isn't working because the gap is getting too long. And I'm a scientist, so I'm like, we're going to find a new way to screw up today. We're not going to do the same thing. We're going to do something different. And we're going to keep screwing up a new way until we find a way to make this work. What happens if we split feedback? Yeah. With freshmen, you don't even have to give an explanation for knowing. Right? Yeah. Just go in there and tell them here's the Yeah. 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 It's not me, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I did, like, the very first day of class, I had like, the name tents, and I had different colors, and I had counted out enough for the 29 students I have, but they didn't realize, like, and I was like, just choose a color, a name tent, and make a name tent. Like, the very first instruction. But then I've been able to utilize different things with the different colors, like, okay, all the pinks get together, like today, to just kind of change up some of the groups, or you must have at least one color in every group. Um, and so, like, um, I did that, and then we looked at their Enneagram numbers and their groups. There. So I kind of change up some of the group um, as well, just to, they have their core group that they're with, but then sometimes I'll go in and change, just so that way they do hear the, the different points and with teaching freshmen I want them to kind of learn each other's names as well so that's yeah well what the thing that struck me with this whole thing is to teach the class how to learn
learned this way is a step I haven't really thought about. But how do I teach them how to use this interactive tool to best of the, for the, for the best of class? And that's not something that just saying. Right. they are bored with or agree with or know how to do. So, and you have to be very clear about why you're doing it this way. Yeah. That's something I need to pay attention to. That's a good point. I was thinking the perception of learning is I come here and do the lecture and then I go home and study. Right? That's learning a lot of the minds. But if you ask them to get granular on, okay, well, how are you studying? What are you doing? I'm on the over the code. I just read stuff over and over. I have some rereading, you know, which is minimally effective. Right? Okay. That's, that's why, like, the opportunity for some self-assessment and self-reflection and modeling that for the students and teaching them how to do that as like with cognitive wrappers and like exam wrappers at the end or there are even like in the book she had one on lectures I'm like that's a little too much for me uh, to actually have them self-assess what they're doing at different points of the lecture I'm like I, I have 50 minutes like that's something that time-wise if I was doing like a four-hour lecture block like I did when I teach grad classes College of Ed, that may be something that I implement, but uh, yeah, teaching that and modeling. What are some other things that you have found that has worked for you when thinking about interactive lecturing, either with your engaging presentation or the act of learning that has been, that's been successful? Um, pretending like I like teaching about functions. <laughs> <laughs> Robin doesn't like it. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretending you're passionate about it. I feel like grading a little bit. Um, students in business communication classes are 15 page work. And so we take it one doc at a time and first um, several debates. I give them a chance to turn it in and get feedback first. And then as I hand them back, I'll say, um, Jeff, you you did something really good. Can I talk about it to the class? With your permission, I might use this as an example. Or, you know, there's something that, that George could have improved on his paper, but it's a common issue. A lot of people do this. May I talk about it to class? Are you okay with that? And um, try to use it as a teaching opportunity and give them a chance to correct it. But, you know, learning is messy and it feels like they're high stakes. So I just try to take the grade pressure off. Give, give more opportunity for feedback because I really want to nurture that love of learning over just doing the bare minimum to be your Yeah, I think that, that's a really great point there because with that feedback, like when you're lecturing and sharing, like, you know, common things or strengths or, you know, opportunities for continued growth, like, you know, you're building that in and, you know, students may not be aware of some of those things. So, and if I didn't do it for this particular thing, I may have done it next one is I if you had not kind of shared that. Yeah. Well so if you want students to participate, in my experience, you must have to assess it a grade a great participation every class meeting. Now this is for for my four hour block. So it's once a week, four hours. And I just use a one to five scale. And I get the grades posted the next day. I let them petition if they think I shorted them, they've got 48 hours to make their case, why they deserve it better. But then you can actually see it, you know, week by week, how students are doing, that gives you the information you need to interact with those who are not doing well, or try to encourage them to do better, give them tips to do better, et cetera. But you know, that's a lot of work to, uh, to do that every week. <clears throat> but I think it's worth it. The only way I've discovered to consistently get students to participate. Otherwise, you get that one of course is three to five feet. Every class, who are talking. And the quality of comments matter, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Not the number of comments. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we we started this semester, um, Casey Neal is our librarian. And so we've had um, several faculty just kind of grumble about third and fourth year pharmacy students don't know how to answer questions using appropriate resources. So we designed, so I guess more so active feedback 
learning. So we gave them very pointed um, questions that they might encounter out in the public as a first year. So like, can I still smoke while I'm using my Nicoderma patch? And so um, then they had to answer the question and then tell us where they found their answer because we wanted them to learn what are reputable sources and what, what isn't. Well, we were going to post a key for them, and then we realized that walking them through our thinking process and how we decide what is a reputable source and what isn't would be much more important. So we started class with our feedback on, here's what most of you said, here were a couple of outliers, here's where I went for this information, here's why. So I think that guided feedback can also be a way for them to um kind of self-reflect and then it it seemed to be like oh like the light bulbs would go off all you know you can kind of see rows at a time where light bulbs went off so that was something that i think has worked well but we gave them a survey to see if they think it worked well so we'll, we'll see if that actually <laughs> results is coming uh -huh. yeah. yeah so thinking about interactive lecturing what are some like when you're thinking about your class session whether it's 50 minutes 75 minutes two <laughs> hours three hours four hours, eight hours. How do you go through and think about structuring um, your, what you're going to be doing in class? I to look through the natural breaks in the lecture. You know, you know, there's there's topics or you know, moving to the different section of that topic and then pass through the questions. So I'm trying to have that break to get them engaged again, to talk to Facebook, and get them to sort of think about what we just talked about in class. That's how it goes. How long are your classes? 50 minutes. And so, how, about how long do you lecture, like you said, like, con, like sections of, the, of lecture content? What are, what's your typical, right, if you have a typical? Yeah, so I, I normally end up having one to two breaks, you know, two breaks a time. Yeah. It's hard to squeeze in more breaks than that. Yeah. So the, the material out and out. Right. It's very simple to go to another question. Or struggle to sort of test it. I did the same, like, the same. I get to try to find at least one kind of natural break about halfway through class. And, but instead of tying it back to the material that I've just covered or that it's going to cover, I usually have it, I usually try to make it not associated whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And just kind of what I can give them mental breaks to, to not think about what they just learned for just a minute to kind of get them off Facebook to re-engage them. And it's usually some type of like uh, quiz thing or, or uh, we use, uh, I use a mentimeter um, so they can kind of put in their own answers and get them re-engaged a little bit. And hopefully they can tackle it. What type of questions do you have? Just usually it's about like TV shows or uh, like it's just random trivia questions. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, so I teach the Bible, so you're not allowed to read structured material. <laughs> but I know, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm finding is that I'm trying to be more interactive. Like I used to just go in and we just went, you know, Luke chapter 5 today, so I just, I read through, put it on the screen, and we read through it, and I discussed, you know, I talked. Now I've, I'm moving from that, and I don't know exactly the what. I still feel like I need to go in the order that it is in the chapter, so that if it's something that I think would be good to discuss, I might discuss at the very beginning, or I have some questions at the beginning, or sometimes I might do for a while and then discuss. And then, but what I found is I'm not, I'm not covering in reverse. I'm skipping lots of things, and maybe if we're doing Luke chapter 5, I might just pick two things out of the whole chapter to talk about. So I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah, so what, what's your goal? Like, if we'll say Luke 5, what's your goal or your outcome for them? 
guess to do what to do chapter five or at least. But now my goal is just to, to have thought about some of that material in an interesting way or how to do But I'm sacrificing, in my mind, I'm sac and I, I could feel some students may be like, you know, we, we didn't even talk about this one story or something. But I guess I'm the teacher, so I get to change. Yeah. <laughs> it does feel bad to leave out parts of my mind. <laughs> but they've all got a thought. Or if you skip to my favorite Bible verse, maybe I can speak up and like, oh, yeah. oh my God. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that's the way. And one thing that I do that I think has worked is have on hand that they have to submit before class answers to certain questions I've asked over that chapter. And then I can just pick from that. And that, and that helps the discussion better because it's not like they're just coming straight in my Sunday school class, adult Sunday school, where we we ask for people to, to meditate and, and talk about something that they didn't know we were going to talk about right. until that day. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, that's helpful. Yeah, and I think you bring up our, with Canvas, I always, like, as Al and I were planning our sessions for the year, like maybe not bringing in how Canvas can support it. So if you have some foundational skills that you're wanting students to know, building out quizzes and some other things before class to kind of see. And then are there some big gaps? You know, looking at the you know, analytics and quiz, like are there gaps that I see that they're missing that I can make sure that we cover in class? Any other last comment, question? Average adult. I always try to think about that and teach students to think about that. Yeah. And try not to go more than 30 in a second. Because, you know, and, and to me, just like what I teach students, fix the energy in the room. Yes. Like, it doesn't have to be a full break. I was lecturing and now I'm doing this, but it's like stop in the lecture and ask questions that change the energy in the room. Or I show a lot of um, like film clips mm -hmm. to make. Just trying to make sure that I've got something here. Yeah. Marsha and I teach a class that's about three hours long. We kind of know what you did for us today is we have an agenda for our students so they have an idea of what our session is going to look like. Because we have them for that long, we try to give them breaks in between so that they can step out. You know, just, that's just a long time for them to take a personal break. Right. In, in class. But um, that way they have an agenda and they can see, okay, we what, what's we're here, we know that we're going to get some kind of break. Right. They, kind of, they kind of have a little bit of warning if we're going to do an activity or something like that. Yeah. That's one thing that we do too. Yeah. That's nice because then if they go first, they just have right. to wait. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. 